speak to you this morning um, in terms of the preaching of the word uh, on the, the on the on the on the concept on the theme um, on the subject that we started about four or five weeks ago on sowing and reaping on seed time and harvest. Today is the fourth uh, Sunday that we are addressing this issue, and uh, I would like to ask you: Have you got it yet? Um, and you know, one of the reasons why we speak on things again and again and again in series is because there's no way that you can even remotely open up the subject fully and to lay a foundation before you even start to build on it uh, and do that in any given Sunday. We, we spread things out over several Sundays. Some of us have heard some of these teaching way back, and I tell you what, <laughs> each time I hear it again, I'm refreshed. Uh, my understanding is refreshed, and I and then the whole practice of it is brought to a new level because we live in the world, uh, we're living in, 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 in the world which is an opposite kingdom to the kingdom of God. And unless the kingdom of God and the values and the principles are refreshed all the time, there's a quiet slipping away uh, and next minute we are operating like uh, the people in the world and, and, and not even know it. And so the preaching of the word brings us back again. Each time we look at the word again, as Pastor Nancy was saying before, just open up the book again, look at the book. Uh, we are brought back again to the values and the principles uh, uh, and, and, and so forth. And, and then our lives are better. Uh, suddenly we, we're not experiencing what everybody else is experiencing in terms of all the disasters, all the calamities and all the stuff that goes on. But our lives are better lives. Our marriages are better. Our relationship is better. Our businesses run better. The job goes better. Uh, everything goes better. We, we do better in our education environment. All around, uh, things are better. And so, if you want your lives to be better, then I really encourage you to listen. I've got some very important things to say today. Don't get distracted. I'm, I'm hoping that the volume is loud enough. I want to be heard in the back row, uh, most definitely. Uh, and so, and, and I want to be heard in the front row and every, everywhere in between because I've got some very important things to share today. If you catch on to this principle that I'm talking about today, it will revolutionize your life. Now, of course, we've already said that we're speaking on sowing and reaping, seed time and harvest, but today I would like to speak to you about words. Uh, and to that effect, I want to read our opening scripture again, then I'm going to pray and then we will launch out. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through the verse 10 in the J.B. Phillips translation, it says, don't be under any illusion. Um, you cannot make a fool of God. A man's harvest in life will depend entirely on what he sows. If he sows for his lower, his own lower nature, his harvest will be the decay and the death of his own nature. But if he sows for the Spirit, he will reap the harvest of everlasting life by the Spirit. Let us not grow tired uh, of doing good, for unless we throw in our hand, the ultimate harvest is assured. Let us then do good to all men as opportunity offers, especially to those who belong to the Christian household. How many of you belong to the Christian household and you know it? The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Uh, we're not undercover agents for the kingdom, but once we are saved, we come out. You know, they talk about coming out and all sorts of other issues and things. Uh, it's time for Christians to come out, praise God, and to be openly and publicly known as believers. Uh, the convention that we just had was all about contending for the kingdom. Uh, and my, how, how good it was. Uh, now, just a couple of repeats before we cover new ground. We says that the quality of our life today is the result of the seeds that we've sown yesterday. What's your life like today? Uh, it is the result of the seeds you've sown yesterday. I do not mean literally yesterday, as in Saturday, because today is Sunday. I'm talking about yesterday, yester years, yester weeks, yester months. Um, Sowing and reaping is a fundamental principle in God's kingdom. It works for everybody all the time, for good or for bad. Sometimes Christians have been Christians all of their life. They got born again at some stage in life, and then at some point in, in, in time they died. Well, of course, we, we, we say died, but actually for us, death is not applicable in the sense of how it is for other people. We just, uh, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They go to heaven and never having learned this principle that we're talking about here, never having grasped it. Uh, they might have heard sort of aspects of it, but never got it. Uh, and so therefore their life was never anywhere uh, up to the level, to the quality that God had intended for it to be. Um, our words are seeds we sow, and there will be a harvest. Say that with me. Our words are seeds we sow, there will be a harvest. Uh, let's say it again. Our words are seeds we sow, there will be a harvest. 
All right? There will be a harvest is a statement. It's a statement of fact. We can't avoid that. We've just read the scripture where it says that what we sow is what we reap. So in other words, there will be a harvest. All right? Let me just pray. Father, we want to commit this time to you once again. And we thank you that you praise him by your spirit. And the true teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit, is present to illuminate the eyes of our understanding. And uh, Lord, to highlight these truths and these principles and to cause our spirit to come alive in a fresh way to lay a hold of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we spoke about uh, our finance being like seed. And so, so it is. Um, this morning I would like to major on words being seeds. Uh, I was almost like sort of wrestling. Uh, you know, there's, there's scriptures that talk about the kingdom of God is like, uh, or that, you know, finance is like a seed. But I would like to suggest that words are not only like seeds, but words are seeds. Words are seeds that we sow. As soon as they've left our mouth, there is a seed floating around, uh, lodging somewhere in, 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 in our lives, in, in our heart, or in somebody else's heart. And, and words have got creative power attached to them. You and I, we have been made in the image and in the likeness of God. And if you read the Bible, you'll find that what I'm discussing today starts way back in the beginning, uh, in the book of Genesis, in the very first chapter, in the very first few verses, and it's discussed, discussed right throughout the Bible, and it's discussed even like in the last chapter there, it is referred and, and inferred in the sense of the whole aspect of the words that we speak. All right? Um, you and I have got the capacity to speak words of love or words of hatred, words of freedom or words of bondage, words of health or words of sickness, and I could go on and on, words of poverty or words of wealth, words of, uh, of, uh, of, of joy or words of depression. We've got that capacity to speak those words. That's why, uh, you know, animals, animals haven't got... To, the, the choices, they haven't got free will like you and I do every day. Free will, we can choose to learn a principle and live by it. Animals just are just animals, all right? And by the way, uh, the monkeys that we see in the zoo, they're not our uncles, all right? They're not our grandparents. We did not come from monkeys. God created us. God created Adam and Eve, placed them into the Garden of Eden, and made them in his own class of being. Now, we're not gods in the sense like God is God, but you are the God of your own life. You create your own world. All right? And as I said, we can speak words, and there will be a harvest. Um, and uh, what I am uh, expecting to a certain extent is that by the time we get to the end of today's sermon, for some of you, it'll literally, literally cut your talk in half. Just suddenly, you, you, you just suddenly, oh, no. <laughs> like when Vanessa and I heard these principles there, it's, it's like, uh, and, and we helped each other with that, and we need a bit of help with this, all right? That's why it's praise God when the husband and wife can help each other rather than sort of point out each other's faults. It's help each other uh, to operate and to walk in this thing because suddenly you're aware and like, oh, no, do I want that to happen? If I don't want it to happen, I better not say it, all right? Nobody can escape the, the harvest of their own words. Nobody. Wise people exclusively speak words of life and do not allow words of death to pass their lips. And I'm not talking like, you know, that say if grandmother dies, you can't say, oh, grandmother died. You just use the word death. I, I, I don't mean that. Every word has either got some aspect of, of life or, or death in it somehow. And of course, we know that there is, in a sense, neutral words when we talk about, say, Say so maths, you know, one plus one is two and so forth. You know, that's, that's not a, a life or death issue. These are just facts and, and so forth. But in our everyday conversation, in statements that we make, and especially, especially when the pressure comes on, it's either death or life that comes out of people's mouth. And, and, and based on those words, a harvest will happen. And so the Christians ought to be the wise people. Um, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in the book of Proverbs today. Um, Proverbs is an awesome book. It's just very practical um, and uh, just very great truths for us to learn from there. The Bible in the book of Proverbs right throughout uh, contrasts wise people to foolish people or the wise man and the fool. Uh, we ought to be the wise man. We ought not to be the fool. Yet many people 
Uh, and this is not about being judgmental or something. This is about laying a hold of some principle and causing it to work for us rather than against us. So I want to start by reading in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, and by the way, there are also little uh, letters there in the uh, brackets typically refer to the version of, of, the, of the translation that we're reading out of or the particular Bible translation. And, and don't get confused by some of it. It's probably more helpful to me than it is to other people when I go back to some of, my, some of the stuff that we've done. Then it lets me know which translation I got that from. So here we go. Um, this is in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Uh, that's what HCSB stands for. He says, My son, if you've put up security for your neighbor or entered into an agreement with a stranger, you have been trapped by the words of your lips and snared by the words of your own mouth. So what that means is that, uh, for example, you know, today, in one translation, talk about surety, being standing as surety for somebody else. Today, we use a more modern word. Uh, it's becoming a guarantor for somebody. Uh, it is not uncommon uh, for parents to become guarantors for their children and they buy a house and require a loan and nobody gives them anything because they're not, they haven't got a, a savings history, they haven't got a, a good record as far as finance is concerned, so they get in on the record of their parents. It's, it's absolutely okay to do that so long as you know who your kids are and that they're not going to turn on you or do something stupid or silly. But he says, if you've become surety for your neighbor, now we know family better than we know neighbors. And sometimes we think we know friends, but sometimes, you know, friends can surprise you with stuff. So what, what he's saying here, he says, look, he says, when you have spoken words of saying, yes, I will do that, you are snared by the words of your own mouth. You're now hooked into this deal, all right? Um, and of course, today, it's not so much through words. Citizens where we get confused. Uh, there was a time when a man's word was his bond. Uh, now, it's signature, signatures, it's, um, it's um, initials. And, and, and so forth, and until we have signed, we are not bound to it. We could have said a hundred times, yes, I'll do it, but un until I sign, I'm not bound to it. The kingdom of heaven doesn't work like that. Once you've said it, you are bound. All right? Once, once it's come out of your mouth, we, we get confused with that modern day uh, deal today. The people say all sorts of things, but they have not fully committed until they've signed. In the kingdom of God, your words is your signature. All right? And so it's saying once you have uh, agreed, entered into that agreement verbally, you're trapped by the words of your lips, you are ensnared by the words of your mouth. Now that's so as far as becoming sure that you're becoming a guarantor for somebody else is concerned, but I would like to suggest to you that there's a general principle here that with your words you're either ensnared or you're liberated. With your words you're either bound up or you're, you're, you're liberated by them. In fact, in the next verse there, in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 13, it says, The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come uh, through trouble. Uh, what's that telling us? Well, well, what would be the transgression of somebody's lips? Their words. And say, well, I don't curse, I don't swear, I don't use swear words, so that not talking about me. Actually... It goes way beyond cursing and swearing. That's one of the first things that ought to get cleaned up when we become born again, to clean up our mouth as far as, you know, in the old days we used to say, you say that again, you use that word again, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. Um, <laughs> and, you know, like, don't use foul words, don't use dirty language, okay? That's one of the first things. But you know what, in the kingdom of God, uh, we can transgress and not even use swear words, which is use gossip, negativity, and we've already transgressed. So the Bible says here, the wicked are ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. Uh, and if you're born again, you're the righteous. You don't even have to be a wicked person and you can still transgress with your lips. Uh, and, and God consider it sin. You see, when, when the 10 spies, the 12 spies, uh, uh, came out of, the, out of the promised land and returned back to Israel that were on the edge of the promised land, Moses said, go in there, spy out the land and come back with a report. The Bible says the 10 spies came back with a negative report and only two of them said, we can do it. The other said, we can't do it. They said, it's true. They were very factual about it. Yes, the land is truly a land that flows with milk and honey and everything is wonderful and just like God said, but we can't do it. The problem was that God said they could do it. So they only took on part of what God said and spoke against the other part that God said. And the Bible says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Amos chapter 3, verse 3. And the answer is, no, you cannot. At a certain point, you will part company if you don't agree with somebody because the constant disagreement will pull the two of you apart. And God does not want us to pull away from him. God wants us to pull towards him. And how do we do that? Many times with the words of our mouth. 
They transgressed by the words of their lips. And God, uh, uh, judgment came on these ten guys very quickly because not only did they, did they bring a bad report, or the Bible calls it an evil report, all they said was, we can't do it. They didn't use curse words, swear words for all we know. In fact, we can read up in the book of Numbers. There's no curse word listed there. There's no swear word listed there. But they said, they said, we can't do it. And God considered those words, the can't do it, an evil report. And they transgressed with their lips. And so you and I need to be very careful and very circumspect with the words that we speak. Because God will consider it transgression. And not only that, but it will work against us somewhere and, and I'm slightly ahead, getting ahead of myself. And, and uh, it says, but the righteous will come through trouble. See, trouble comes to everybody. Um, the Bible says that the sun will shine on the righteous and on the unrighteous, and the rains will come down on the righteous. Storms of life will come to everybody, but we come through. And other people go down and don't come through it. Um, and, and so it's like, uh, but there is a way, there is a way to go through a, a, a troubled situation and to come out the other side and to, as it were, to use a figure of speech, you haven't even got the smell of smoke on you. Uh, like, you, you know, you go through the flood and you're not even, you, you never even got wet. Uh, it was all around you, stuff was going on, and, and people like going down left, right, and center. The Bible says in Psalm 91, a thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it shall not come near us. It, it didn't actually touch us. We were in the middle of it. And we came through, but it never even touched us. And if it touched us, we shook ourselves off and we just carried on. The righteous come through trouble. These are not just pretty words. This is not just nice poetry. This is truth. I know about you, but I don't want to be one of the ones that has transgressed with his lips and then paying the price for it. I want to be one of the ones that but it says here that, uh, let me. but the righteous will come through trouble. See, our words bind us to whatever we have been saying. Your words bind you or tie you into what you're saying. And somebody said once, you can never rise above the level of your confession. You can never rise above the level of your words. People would say things like, well, you know, the family that I come from, we have ne none of us ever got anywhere really. Uh, and, and, you know, our ancestors, just, 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 just who we are, that's just what we're, we're quite okay. You know, we're just, we're just, Make do we do the best we can, but you know, it's just like, well, you can't rise above that. You can't rise above the level of your words. You've got to change. You've got to change uh, your belief system in, in this whole area, and you've got to change your confession. We are literally trapped or liberated by the words we speak. Um, it's just reminded before uh, when, when, uh, when I grew up and sort of left home and ran away, then my father, I was, uh, my father operated a, a, um, a farm as well as a, um, a sawmill. And uh, in my teenage years, uh, in the early days, uh, uh, I, I was the worker with my father. I went to school, and after school I worked on the sawmill. And, uh, and the sawmill wasn't huge. It wasn't a large operation. It was a one-man band, if you like. Uh, but it got to the stage when I had gone, and then there was none of the other kids. My younger brother had already got, gone off to... to uh, boarding school and going to university and everything. There was n none of the kids left anymore. Um, uh, my, older br uh, my second older brother ended up taking over the show, but there was periods when there was nobody around. So my father employed one of the farmers uh, from the neighborhood uh, who came and helped him. Um, this man wasn't the main farmer on that farm. He was kind of, uh, you know, he had, sort of, sort of had his issues, had his struggles, and never really uh, uh, achieved uh, all, all that well. And... Uh, and he was at a, in about, at that stage, I met him a couple of times. Uh, he was about in his mid-40s, I guess, uh, 40, 45 years old. And uh, you'd listen to him. He was sort of happy, a happy guy on the one hand, but on the other hand, he began to say things that he should not have said. He said, oh, it's hard. It's really hard. And uh, he said, oh, it's hard. And so he kept on using the word hard, hard. And next minute I hear, I, I wasn't there. I'd already left the country at that stage, but... Uh, but I heard that he started to run around with a rope in his pocket, just a little short rope, and you, you can see where this is headed, uh, because he ended up committing suicide. And it all started by saying, oh, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. And so what happened was, with the words of his mouth, uh, he began to confirm some of the feelings he was having. And, you know, uh, uh, periods of depression is not entirely uncommon in people's lives, but you've got to just watch what you say. 
And that's not to say that you can't tell anybody. You can, you can, you can seek help and you can uh, seek counsel from somebody, but don't walk around saying it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Those words will catch up with you. There will be a harvest. And there's no doubt other things that the man said, and it's a real tragedy that this man was ripped out of his, out of his life in, in, in middle age and, and everything, and because it all started with words that he began to speak. So we're literally trapped or liberated by the words we speak. Here it is, Proverbs 12:6. Uh, the words of the wicked are a deadly ambush, but the speech of the upright rescues them. Now please note that when it speaks about the words of the wicked, it's not that their words become an ambush to the righteous. It's not how it works. The words of the wicked become an ambush to the wicked, to themselves. And the speech of the righteous rescues us. Speech is words. Careless words spoken set up an ambush for us somewhere down the track. But wholesome words act as a preservation force in our lives. And so I am, if you like, over here. It is Sunday. Uh, what is it today? The 9th of June. Would that be correct? Of 2013. For those people that are listening to the audio recording of this message, like, oh, is that how old this message is? But you know, this truth is always good. It's always good. Praise God. <laughs> and so I'm over here and I'm speaking careless words. I'm speaking words of death. Um, but I might do it with a smile on my hand. It's like, <laughs> you know, like, I think because I'm smiling, I'm actually saying the right words. It's good to smile, but just because I'm smiling doesn't mean that my words are necessarily words of, words of life. And sometimes people do that. They smile, yet they're really releasing poison at their mouth. You see, gossip sometimes smile, but they're, you know, the Bible says a, a, a gossip is like a tasty trifle that goes down on the inside. And so just because they smile doesn't mean that they're not gossips. Um, so, um, the wicked are, the words of the wicked are like a deadly ambush. So I'm careless now with my words. I'm saying things. I'm speaking off the top of my head. I'm speaking my mind. Okay? What I don't realize, oh, then that's bad. Okay? And sometimes people say, well, I've got to speak the truth. I've got to tell the truth. That is no excuse to speak words uh, that, that you ought not to say. Sometimes when people say, I've got to tell the truth, it's almost like a, a disclaimer that what's about to come out, they're justifying themselves. I've got to tell the truth. Everybody's got to tell the truth. But certain things ought not to be spoken. And so I'm now speaking words, I'm careless. What I don't realize is that my words will travel out of my mouth, will travel ahead of me, and we're still in June. By now I'm about in July. And I could now be in August. And now I'm in September. And suddenly something comes on me. Like, hello, what's going on here? I'm now ambushed. And you know what an ambush is? An ambush is not a situation where, say, say, say you travel from here to Auckland and you know that in Taupo there are some bandits on the side of the road that are just waiting for you to travel through there. They're going to... You know, they're going to do something to you. They're going to try to shoot at you or something. That's not an ambush. That's like you know that that's coming. An ambush is an attack from, from a concealed location. Uh, you don't know when it's coming, and, uh, but yet you're still ambushed. And in fact, <laughs> I got in my dictionary here, um, an ambush is an act or instance of being attacked unexpectedly from a concealed position. And so something happens... And because I don't know the principle of sowing and reaping, say, I don't understand that my words are seeds that I sow that will either deliver me or bind me up. And I could be hit with something in August and not even realize that it goes right back to the 9th of June when I was being careless and I got a bit worked up and, uh, you know, something happened. And in the pressure of the moment, I released words that I should not have said. You know, sometimes we say that, you know, just... Sometimes it's, 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 it may be necessary to say, I pull back those words. Lord, I repent and I, I pull up that, that, that seed right now in Jesus' name. And th to a certain extent, it is valid to do that. Now, of course, if you have to do that all day, every day, and do it month after month, year after year, something is wrong. <laughs> okay. And so there was an ambush. I'm now attacked. And uh, I don't realize 
why it's happening. I didn't realize when it was happening, but yet it comes back to the words that I spoke out of my own life. Is this true? Well, the word is either true or it's not. Whether we can get our head around that and how that works or whether we can't is actually not the point. The word is true. God is trying to warn us. Be careful, God says, I've made you in my image and in my likeness. Don't you release words of death because they will go out of your mouth. They will set an ambush for you. But it says here, but the speech of the righteous rescues them. What is the speech of the righteous? Wholesome words. Words of life. The righteous don't use uh, words like can't afford. Because three months later, you want, you want to be able to buy something and say, I can't afford it. It goes back to what you've said. And like we've said before, when we learn the language of life, which is learn to, to negotiate through life, and it's not like, oh, I can't say it anymore. You can't say it. It's just how you say it. And what words that you use, like for example, and I've said this before, Vanessa and I don't use the term, we can't afford that. Uh, we say it's not convenient to buy that right now. It's, it's, it's saying, saying the same thing, but it's using words of life. I'm now in charge rather than putting the, my financial uh, circumstances in charge. My finances are not in charge. I'm in charge. So careless words set an ambush for us somewhere down the track. And wholesome words act as a preservation force in our lives. And so there's a situation where sometimes something happens. There could be an economic situation. There could be another situation. So, oh, everybody went down. Well, no, not everybody did. Not everybody did. Some cruised right through it. Sometimes people say, recession? What recession? Well, where, what, what's happened here? They sold words way back, not months, but possibly years ago, that, uh, you know, as tight as the windows of heaven are open, blessings are being put out in abundance. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings. They spoke words of righteousness, and they cruised right through it, and those words delivered them. Proverbs 12, 14. But the, from the fruit of the lips, people are filled with good things, and the work of their hands bring them reward. From the fruit of their lips, people are filled with good things. What's the fruit of our lips? It's words. Our lips are designed uh, primarily for speaking words. I suppose, in a funny sort of a way, when we eat, our lips help us to keep food inside until we can chew it. But otherwise, lips, so you read through the Bible, uh, the, the lips is like speaking about words. That's what that's about. <laughs> Meant to be a joke and nobody laughed. So on the fruit of their lips, people are filled with good things. See, judging by the careless words of speaking, many people have no idea that their words either enrich them or impoverish them. You get in amongst wealthy people, successful people. You do not hear poverty spoken. You just don't hear it. You get in, in amongst uh, people that are struggling economically and always have, and you get in amongst their family, the whole environment is one of just, oh, the government, they're not giving us enough money and the benefit has not been put up, and that's just what they speak. And you know what? Their words tie them into, those, uh, those, uh, into that situation, bind them into that situation, into that level of lifestyle, of always relying on other people to give them a handout rather than being able to rise up themselves and relying on their God-given talents and, and, and so forth to, 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 uh, to earn a, a good living and, and, and so forth. How many of you know what I'm saying? So this is not about taking a dig at anybody. It's simply pointing out facts that are written for us in the book of Proverbs and, in fact, throughout the whole Bible uh, that God needs us to be careful with the words that we speak because uh, we're either filled with good things or something is taken away from us. I um, met a man many years ago that um, sort of quite a sad situation. He had done quite well for himself and uh, in fact he had done very well for himself and life was going good and he was married and kids, everything was wonderful and suddenly he got struck down um, with a very hideous disease. Um, and, uh, and he came to see me. I wasn't his pastor, but he somehow came to visit me um, and, and sort of felt the liberty to just turn up and have a quick chat and everything. That was all right. And, and so uh, and in the process of me listening to this man and trying to encourage him in his situation, trying to put the word in there, he, he began to kind of confess. I and mean, he didn't realize that, uh, that it was like you know, so to him opening the lid on what was really going on. But he basically said, well, you know what? I was, uh, things were going really well for me. And I began to wonder if that was going to last. 
And I kind of thought, gee, uh, good things don't last, last forever. And so he somehow developed this mental attitude of, this is not going to last. This is not going to last. Now, I didn't know him prior to that, so I was not around. But I'm suggesting to you that that concept that he developed out of the abundance of the, of the heart, the mouth speaks, he made confessions somewhere, somewhere in the process of him while he was still doing well and those words were setting an ambush for him. And I mean, how would you tell? How would you tell a person like that to say, uh, when he suddenly comes over here and suddenly something strikes him, it's like, hey, is it possible that you've set an ambush for yourself with the words. Have you been speaking disaster over your life? Have you been speaking calamity? Have you been speaking, speaking sickness and disease? And have you been like casting doubt over the success of your own life? And have you been saying that, that you know, good things don't last forever and, and such like? And that's exactly, uh, in, in my estimation, what happened. The man cursed his own life. Did he use swearers? No, no. He was a good Christian man, but he was struck down. Uh, and how tragic is that and when people set ambushes for themselves? Um, it says, the work of their hand brings them reward. You see, by the fruit, by the fruit of our lips, we either bless or curse the work of our hands. Uh, people work hard, uh, and, and, and yet with their words, we can either bless the work of our hands so it gives us the yield that we, we would want from it, or we work hard and... Uh, there's nothing coming our way. There's no reward at the other end. What does that look like? It says, well, you know, we work so hard, and but really there's not much in it anymore these days. You know, the economy is very hard, and the government's made it difficult. There's just, you know, taxes and everything. There's not much in it anymore these days. And, 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 and people say, oh, there's nothing in it anymore. I'm just working. You know, it's all I'm doing now. With the words of your own mouth, you're setting an ambush against yourself. If you're in a particular field of industry and so forth that is no longer what it used to be and you feel the need to get out, then get out and retrain and do something else. But be careful what you say. And sometimes people struggle on, struggle on, and struggle on, and things have got hard, and it'll they only get harder because the words of their mouth will, will stifle uh, any yield that is supposed to come. The Bible says that the laborer is worthy of his hire. That's a general principle. Somebody does something, does something productive and worthwhile, there ought to be something coming back. If somebody puts in 40 hours in a job situation, somebody, they, ought, they ought to be paid for that. Uh, if somebody invests money uh, in a business situation or in some investment, you know, if it's a good investment, there ought to be something coming back. But if nothing is coming back, then it's either the wrong investment or the wrong environment to be involved in, or it could be the words that somebody has spoken that they've set an ambush for themselves. Is this helping anybody today? All right. Uh, Proverbs 18.20. From the fruit of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. What's that telling us? Exactly what we've just said. You know, when he talks about stomach, um, here, in uh, Proverbs 18.20, it means stomach. There's nothing spiritual about that. He says, from the fruit of their mouth, that's the words, a person's stomach is filled. And, uh, and, and so, how can words fill somebody's stomach? Well, words directly in, in themselves don't fill somebody's stomach. Words will go out and they will create an environment where somebody will have a job, somebody will have a business, they'll have some sort of a form of income because God wants to bless the work of our hands and then there's the yield coming back. All right? With the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. Uh, when I say I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then I'm speaking blessing over my whole life. I'm speaking blessing over everything that I'm involved in, little things and big things. But at the same time, I can say, oh, you know, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, and all sorts of other things. And I'm actually hindering the yield from coming my way. Proverbs 13.3 th uh, Anyone who guards what he says, I start again. Anyone who guards what he says guards his life. But anyone who speaks without thinking will be destroyed. <laughs> I don't know about you, but those sorts of things are like, like, like a slap to me. It's like, wake up, snap out of it. What are you saying? People 
will do all sorts of things to guard their life. And in some instances, people are very protective in their home. You know, they put bars over windows and they'll put traps and gates and all sorts of security alarms, everything, everything in place. But they're loose with their words. Friend, don't speak your mind. Don't do that. And by the way, don't talk a lot. And you'll see in a moment why. If you're a talker, you're known as a talker, watch out. Watch out. Anyone who guards what he says, <laughs> guards his life. So in other words, putting up security bars on the window, if that's necessary, do it. You know, I don't care, you know, that's it. Do, do whatever you need to do. But you primarily guard your life, your own safety with the words that you speak. Because again, Psalm 91, it says, a thousand may fall at their side and 10,000 at their right hand. All of these guys put up guards and bars and, and everything else, but, but they got taken down and they got taken out. But the righteous, because of words of righteousness, words of life that they spoke. So Vanessa and I, we learned this, these truths many years ago. We took a hold of it and said, this is it. This, this, this is it. We... we this is, this is now going to be, become our life. That, that's what, that's what we, we got it. We got it. And we sat down, and in, in not so many sort of settings and meetings, but this, along the way, we agreed on certain things that certain words we will not speak anymore. We did some marriage uh, seminars way back. Uh, and some of you have been there. And some of you might remember my testimony that in the early days of our marriage, I, uh, I had the words divorce floating around in my head. Uh, and to what extent I might have verbalized that, I don't know. But I got to the stage say, I'm not even just, uh, not, most definitely not going to verbalize it anymore. And I'm not going to entertain the thought in my mind anymore. The word divorce will be ripped out of the pages of my vocabulary that I carry around in my head. And it will just not be found anymore. If I were to look for it, it will not be found. And our marriage improved by simply making a decision that I will not use the words divorce to threaten, to undermine that which God has established. You speak divorce and making threats, threats, threats. You're pulling out the rug from under yourself and under your, your spouse and under your marriage. It's just one example. You can pull out the rug from under yourself uh, financially. You can pull out the rug from under you out of your, out, out, out of, out of your happiness. It's just amazing what you can do. Anyone who guards what he says guards his life. But anyone who speaks without thinking will be destroyed. And here it is. For those of you that are talkers, there you are. Proverbs 10, 19. In the words, I start again. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. In fact, in the King James Version, it's even... Uh, it's quite obscure. It says, in the multitude of words, sin wanteth not. And nobody understands that anymore today unless you've had it explained. So what that means is that if somebody talks a lot, sin is in their mouth, inevitably. Somewhere, because of their incessant need to talk all the time, when they run out of good things to say, they will speak idle words and worse, they will speak words of death and somehow they will engage in gossip somewhere because their constant need to be heard and constant need to talk. Now, I can talk sometimes, uh, I mean, I can talk for a long time, but, but, but I'm just as happy to not say a word for a long time. And this is not about so much being an introvert or an extrovert. This is simply about just curbing the need to talk all the time. Now, of course, you get a bunch of quiet people together and then you'll be very glad to have somebody there that knows how to talk because quiet people just... You can be so quiet that you make other, other people suspicious. <laughs> Vanessa and I were talking about this one dear man who is so quiet. And Vanessa says, oh, he doesn't like me. I says, no. Nah. No, nah, it's not that he doesn't like you. He just doesn't know how to express himself. And... But, you know, if you're so quiet and you're at the other extreme, you need to start talking a little bit and communicate. You get people. The devil is always in the extremes. 
that was not in the middle of the road. He's, he's in one ditch or in the other ditch. He tries to ta drag you over here or drag you over there. So if you're always quiet and never say anything, you'll make people suspicious in regards to what's going on in your heart because you're, you're not sharing what's going on in your heart. I had to learn to share. Listen, I'll go out for, for dinner and, and I'll just sit there and I'll just observe. You know, I'm a great observer. and I, I'm a great listener, I tell you. Uh, and she says, say something. <laughs> say something. Say what? I'm just out for dinner. She's having a good time. <laughs> So I had to learn to share, share my life, share, you know, just share. So as I said, the devil is in the extremes. So, so if you talk a lot, uh, there's sin, there's somewhere. But he who restrains his lips is wise. So, you know, don't speak your mind ever. And don't talk a lot. That's what the Bible tells us to do. The Bible says... Be quick to hear and slow to speak. Why do we need to be slow to speak? Because I get into a situation and, and rather than just opening my mouth and then engaging my brain five minutes after I've spoken, engage your brain first. Think about what you're going to say. Is that a dear man that, uh, you know, just know him so well and just love talking, just a real encourager and just in many respects just very good, but... But we, we learn some of these things, and it's, uh, I don't know what to say anymore. Well, that's a good thing for a little while until you're able to sift out, use the, si the sieve of the Word of God and sift out, you know, strain out the words that should no longer be spoken. And if it cuts your communication in half, then so be it. Don't just pour everything all over everybody all the time and talk all the time. And It's funny. I'm talking now. And the problem is, the problem is that most times people, real talkers, completely miss the point. They don't see themselves as talkers. I remember Vanessa and I were in this, in this church. Uh, there was a workshop going on. I forget the details now, but there was this dear lady. She had opened her mouth and she just couldn't get a word in edgewise anymore. It's just terrible. And some of these people, they, they, they talk, they don't breathe. They, they just talk. They, 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 supernaturally, they seem to be able to just exhale and speak words all the time without drawing breath. Some of us, when we speak, you know, when we speak, there's air that comes out of our, our lungs, and then we have to draw back in again. Some of these people just, oh, I don't know where they get the air from. Because in the rule of conversation, you say something, and then you breathe, and you let somebody else say something. That's the rule of conversation. <laughs> and it doesn't get any more basic than that. But with these people, in fact, I made a terrible mistake. We had this visitor. It, uh, before I get away saying, yes, I think I will. Otherwise, the words might ambush me <laughs> in time to come if somebody listens to this tape. This dear man came to one of our functions here, and, um, and he's one of those guys that just incessantly talks. And he's very good at it, and very funny. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and so anyway, so... I saw him sitting having dinner with somebody. We were out at the function. I saw him having dinner with... By the way, this is not anybody here. And hardly any of you know the man, so don't try... I wonder who that is. Don't do that, okay? Uh, he's sitting down, and he's talking. I was being very naughty. Like, I was really pushing the envelope there. Um, whether he ever got it, I don't know. But I may know when I tapped the guy on the shoulder that he was talking to, and I says, when he breathes, you get in quickly. Otherwise, you miss that... You, or something to that effect. And he looked at me, it's like, it's like I'd slapped him. Just about. It's like, like you know. <laughs> so they caught him by surprise. Probably a good thing. Some of these people should be slapped. Just, but, but not literally, of course. We, we wouldn't do a thing like that. We, we are Christians. <laughs> Slap. So don't talk a lot. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. And uh, I'm not going to move on because some of you are trying to stare me out now and say, are you speaking about me? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> don't speak your mind and don't talk a lot. Both these bad habits will diminish the quality and the length of your life. Um, you can literally wreck your life by the words you speak. And in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. Sin will be in there somewhere. 
because people just speak their mind. Here in Proverbs 18.20, a man fills his belly with the fruits of his mouth. Here it is again, speaking about the belly, about the stomach. Uh, and with the words of his mouth, he's able to fill his belly. He will be satisfied by the fruits of his lips. And here it is, and this is the key scripture that we use so many times. Uh, it says that life and death are in the power of the tongue, and they, they that rule it will eat the fruits thereof. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Your words, my words, we've got the, 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 the choice, the ability to release with it life and death. And if we had time, we would swing into the book of, of James where the Bible tells us that our tongue is like the rudder of a ship. And we can turn our ship around if we don't like the direction that we're going in or we don't like the scenery. Uh, we can steer out of that situation and move to a different scenery. If the scenery looks nothing like lack and want and poverty and sickness and disease, you can steer out of that situation into a new scenery where it's nice and serene and peaceful. If your marriage is all troubled, check up on some of the words you've been speaking or what you've been meditating on for some time. Because whatever you meditate on inevitably, it'll start come out, come out of your mouth. Because eventually, eventually, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then James goes further. And James has got some good punchy truth and good punchy sayings. He's, he says, he says, you know, when a spring, he says, a spring, um, and you know, they're talking Middle East, they literally have poisoned water over there pouring out of the ground. And we have that here in places. You walk up into some of the geothermal areas and there's water oozing out of the ground. You just say, oh, I'm going to drink from that. It's poisonous. But you know what? A spring is either poisonous or it's fresh water. It's never or talk back and forth. It's only with people. It's only with, the, with, 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 with our mouth that we can speak both words of blessing, words of curses, or at the same time, also alternatively. And James says, let it be one or let it be the other. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and they that rule it, they that rule it, they that rule what? That rule the tongue. If you rule the tongue, you will eat the fruits. In fact, we will all eat the fruits of whatever we have spoken. But wise people rule their tongue, consider their words before they speak, and then speak very circumspectly rather than the first thing that comes to mind. When were you under severe pressure the last time that you asked you? Something went down and it wasn't good. Could have been in a marriage situation, could have been on the job, could have been... Let me ask you, let me ask you, what came out of your mouth at that time? Because typically pressure reveals what's in the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As many years ago, I thought I pretty much got on top of foul language, pretty much. And I thought I was actually quite proud of myself. It's like, man, I used to swear before I got born again and say things like, oh, terrible, like, oh, gee, I don't even want to go there anymore. But you know what? I thought I was on top of it until I got into a pressure situation. And suddenly, mm, it, it just all came out. Like somebody had put their arms around me and squeezed me hard and a word came out that I thought I'd dealt with years ago. And, and you know, I, I, I could even say, oh, no, I don't know where that came from. Oh, I know where it came from. It came out of my heart. It's been there all along. My friend, you meditate on certain things. Watch out. A pressure moment will bring it out. It's not, it's not if, but it is when. And certain places in our minds, we don't travel. We, we use this saying now, oh, don't go there. People might not go there, but, you know, with their words, if they have any say about it. But if you go there in your mind, you will go there with your, with your mouth eventually. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer will calm a, man's, a person's anger, and an unkind answer will cause more anger. Again, this is now in a conversation. This is now in a setting where there's more than one person. Uh, I'm not talking about answering my own anger. You know, there's ways to deal with, with, with anger and, and frustration and so forth. Um, but it says here, a gentle answer will come. So if somebody comes to me and is all worked up, Brains popping out, heckles her up, really angry. Expresses the anger through the fruit of their mouth, like the words they speak. The Bible says a gentle answer will turn that person's wrath. Now, whether that, that, 
that person still got their own problem. They still have to deal with their own anger. But in that situation, I can diffuse that situation by the words of my mouth uh, and to a certain extent we exercise control over other people's behavior and it is possible. It is possible. Uh, an unkind answer. So somebody just said something to me, I'm now answering. An unkind answer will cause more anger. A soft answer. Train ourselves to give soft answer. Wife, train yourself to give a soft answer rather than a caustic answer when something goes down that you don't like. Husband, train yourself. The same area. Your marriage will be better. So an answer is given in words and it either brings death or life into that situation, into that relationship. I'm moving along quickly now because I, there are a few things I still have to say. Proverbs 15:23. a person has joy in giving an appropriate answer and a word at the right time, how good is it? New King James Version says, a word spoken in due season. So in other words, I might have certain words that I need to speak, but I need to pick my timing rather than speaking my mind because it's uppermost in my mind. I need to like regurgitate it out. No, no, no. I need to now bite my time and wait for the right time. If it's anything to do with conflict in the relationship or, or just that sort of stuff, timing is everything. And, well, it's, it's, it goes a long way. And, of course, it's timing and then it's how you do that. Uh, if you do it with anger, with great frustration, it'll not be received. Do you know what? Uh, that arguments in relationships, most notably in marriages and in family situations, arguments is like like uh, uh, trench warfare. And uh, trench warfare, typically no site makes any progress. They're all just dug in. They're sitting in their trench. How many of you have seen the movie The War Horse? The War Horse, some of you have. It's actually a very good movie. Not to say that you need to rush out and go and see it, but if you want to see it, uh, it it's a good movie. Um, and it describes the uh, trench warfare in the First World War, how over here you had one group, over there you had another group, and typically the Germans are one, on one of the sides, and uh, you know, in terms of world wars, and, uh, and, and there was just stuff going on, and they were all dug in, and, uh, and, and terribly what they used to do, and this is not necessarily in terms of the teaching of the word, then in the end, because they couldn't make any, any progress, because there was just sniping going back and forth, and, and neither side made any, so they brought in uh, mast uh, mustard gas, Mustard gas is basically a gas that they released in the right wing conditions that went from one from one uh, trench to over into the enemy side, and then it, uh, and it's a very caustic uh, type situation for anybody that understands mustard gas. Uh, mustard gas it smells like mustard or like horseradish, quite strong and pungent, and it begins to affect people's skin in a terrible way, and their respiratory system is drawing in and out, and in many cases was fatal. Um, and sometimes when people have had their argument and they've dug in their trenches and you walk into that setting, it's like, like in the realm of the spirit, you can smell the mustard gas now. They're now trying to gas each other with bad attitudes and the silent treatment like, I'm just not going to say anything for a long time. Long time. This woman, I might have told this story before. I read this article once that this woman in the States, um, I shouldn't have said where it was, but anyway, it was in the States now that the word's out. She resorted to writing notes to her husband uh, and never said another word for years. By the time he had boxes full of little handwritten notes, dinners in the fridge, uh, I'm gone my mum's place for two days, you know, just notes, no, no word anymore. Uh, I think the whole thing lasted, I think he actually did quite well, he lasted about 15 years or something in the end, he said, I'm out of here now, this is too much, you know, like that attitude, there was that, that, that mustard gas floating around all day, bad attitude, bad attitude. Uh, <laughs> so that's what it is, uh, arguing is like trench warfare, pick your moment, pick your moment and have the right attitude. If your attitude's bad, the Bible says if somebody's overtaken in the spiritual fault, James chapter 6, you who are spiritual, go and restore such a one in the spirit of meekness and love. Watch your attitude. Jesus talked about it in terms of judging others and everything. He says, he says you try to 
take the speck out of somebody else's eye. He says, take the log out of your own eye first before you try to deal with somebody else's speck. Some people got a whole forest in their eyes. <laughs> Proverbs 25, 11, the right word spoken at the right time is as beautiful as gold apples in a silver bowl. We should choose our words as carefully as what we might choose jewelry that we want to wear for the rest of our lives. Apples of gold in a setting of silver. Be careful with the words that you speak. And then the last scripture that I'm, um, the last two, Proverbs 15, 26, the thought of, thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. The words of the pure are pleasant. If if their words are unpleasant, they're probably not coming from pure people. And you and I as believers, we cleanse our lives of, of not just of swear words, which is obviously a good thing to do, but of attitudes and stuff that causes us to say stuff. Uh, last scripture here, Proverbs 16.24, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, um, sweetness to the soul. Sweetness, it speaks here, sweet, sweet, rather than bitter. Excuse me, and health to the bones. I was just thinking of um, when I grew up, thinking back now, I was at a very good family life. Things weren't perfect, but my mom would be one of the closest people to the virtuous woman that is talked about in Proverbs chapter 31, where it's just an amazing, born again, just love God, but not in, 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 a, in a very expressive sort of a way, as what well, us Pentecostal might, you know, like, and, and everything. But, but in many respects, I grew up in, in quite a sheltered uh, environment. When I'm in shelter, there was a, a father there. There was a mother there. There weren't two fathers or two mothers. There was a father and a mother, how God had intended it. There were brothers and sisters there. We scrapped a little bit, but, you know, we made up again. We all get on well. We don't, we don't hold stuff against each other that went down 20, 30, 40 years ago. It just does not happen in our family. We get over it and then we get on with it. Um, but you know, sadly, that is not, not everybody is as blessed with the environment that they've grown up in, depending on where you've come from. It's not my place to judge where you've come from, but depending on where you have grown up, you have embraced a certain lifestyle, a certain way of operating that is completely, completely contrary to the way that God's Word operated. And sometimes the sins of the fathers are passed on to the children in the sense of that just like dad, that's how he operates. Just like dad, you know, dad got angry, he gets angry. Mom had the silent treatment, she does the silent treatment. It's just like, just like, just like the old man, you know. And, and so, so judge yourself on that. And don't repeat the sins of, uh, of your parents or of that environment. And praise God, if there's parents around many times, that is not the case anymore today. With the whole fragmentation of families and, and so forth, and then uh, certain cultural settings, what is completely normal in that cultural setting is not normal in the culture of the kingdom. We're very severe on judging ourselves and judging those things to, so that we can call ourselves kingdom people and that we're operating with sweetness of soul and that we bring health to the bones rather than pouring out gossip and caustic uh, comments as we go around, and as I said, because that's what sometimes people are used to, but in the kingdom of God, we don't do that. Anyway, I think I've pretty much come to the end of what I'm about to say. We've run out of time. I trust that uh, for those of you that have heard this teaching before, that this has been a little refresher. And for others of you that haven't heard that before, lay a hold of it. Don't throw the outline away. Keep it. Go over it again and make that one of your little study things until that truth is established in your heart. Proverbs, I mean, the whole Bible is a fantastic book, but Proverbs is a good thing to read to clean some of those truths and to let it sink into our lives and bring forth transformation. Father, Today, as we wrap up this service, we thank you once again for speaking to us. I thank you, Father, that, Lord, uh, these truths, uh, Lord, are well-established in each and every heart here, that you're illuminating the eyes of our understanding and helping us to lay a hold of it. And, Lord, we're going to be better servants in your kingdom, better people. Our environment will be better. Our marriages will be better. Our job situation will go better. Everything will go better because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We're going to dismiss right here. But that said, if you need prayer or anything, uh, as others people go, just feel free to come down the front. Somebody's going to pray uh, with you. And uh, let's trust God for good things. Let's have a good week and let's watch the words that we speak. God bless you.